I like Pokemon, but they don't make it easy. The series has a lot of discourse online. Every time a new game comes out, Twitter is a battlefield for like a week. Big series with a lot of fans and a lot of opinions. Somehow this image exists, and somehow despite all that, there's one general consensus. Red and blue have not aged well. Anytime somebody talks about the series as a whole, or does one of these like tier ranking things, for some reason nobody wants to play old janky Game Boy games that don't work anymore. But isn't that kind of abnormal for a franchise as beloved as this? People still play old games for other series all the time, and they keep re-releasing the same few NES and SNES games that have all aged to varying degrees. People are Earthbound fans. And Pokemon is kind of unique where I don't think many people see value in the first few games beyond nostalgia. And like, why would you? They're slow, they're buggy, uh, it looks like this, and they've been remade twice now. But I think there's something about Red and Blue that I've always kind of gravitated towards. I have a weird history with these games and series as a whole. I never actually played one of these games legitimately until way later when X and Y released because mommy would not buy me a DS for Christmas and fear a portable game system would mean my addiction would never be satiated and I mean she was right, but I was a little zoomer boy with a crappy android tablet, google.com, and ignorance of the law. I've beaten every generation at least once and I promise you this is not a joke, uh, this is my ranking for the games. <laughs> So is there something wrong with me, or are Red and Blue better than they say? Or are they still worth playing? Why did I put both remakes lower? Like, EV people understand, but wh <laughs> why did I do this? Well, if you want to know, come with me on this pre-recorded adventure, and I'm going to figure it out. The early games actually start really fast. You put in your name, your rival's name, you get stopped trying to grab the starter, and I already need to address that this game is unplayable at normal speeds. Yeah, this needs emulator speed up to, like, function. I'm serious. I'm gonna show this entire first battle as it happened to me without cuts or speed ups, and I'll add in some funny edits. Uh, see you in two minutes. Yeah, nobody has the time or the patience to play this at the intended speed. Uh, luckily, you're not playing this on real hardware, so you can crank up that max frame rate and mash A. Every game starts like this where your only combat options are use a potion, leave, or tackle and hope the Pidgey dies first. I don't want to fault the game too much for this since I think every game in the series before like black and white are also unbearable without speed up to various extents. But with the power of breaking the law, it's really not that bad. I don't want this entire video to just be me explaining like what happens in the game. The actual mechanics of this game are Pokemon, you, you know how to play Pokemon. Not a lot happens to the first like three gyms, so I'm gonna go through this quick and only stop when I have something to say. I think Brock is actually one of the better first gyms in the series. He's basically just a check to make sure you have an elemental move on your starter and teaches you that super effective moves are a thing. Even if you pick Charmander, Ember doesn't do bad in this fight, and he doesn't actually have any rock moves to counter you. It's nothing fancy, but I think he does the job, and it does more than a lot of other first gym leaders do teaching you. Like, what's the point of making me fight bug gym leaders? Like, it just tells me bugs are bad. And I mean, that's not untrue, but it's not helpful. I remember at this point that you are supposed to catch enough multiple Pokemon on your team in this game. 
problem with a lot of these games where the Route 1 Pokemon are, are just kind of uninteresting, and you kind of go for a while without another team member if you're looking for something that's not a bird. But this is the area where you find Sanchu, who is awesome, and will go onto the team always forever because I love him. Cerulean's also the second time you fight the rival. Yeah, there's an optional fight before this, but I just skip it because I, I don't care. I feel like I hear a lot of people praise the rivals in the early games, and then ones in the later gens they don't really feel like they should exist at all. Generally, you're just kind of told that they're your friends, and they're really boring and complete pushovers, and no one really cares. I think they found their footing with them again though. I don't like Hop that much, but he's an interesting subversion. It's kind of a non-rival, and I appreciate that they tried. I actually really like Nimona's dynamic of already being a champion and trying to like train you up to her level. But between gens like 3 and 7, there's only a couple rivals that stick out. Blue is really simple, but he is probably the most effective rival they've made. He has an ego, he talks big shit, and the worst part is he has the strength to back it up. If you check the signs in the gyms, he'll always have beat it before you. He'll always have caught more Pokemon before you because he cheats and it's not physical possible. And he's also significantly higher level than the other trainers, and he has four Pokemon. I mean, one of them is just an Abra that sandbags, but like, four. He's really simple, but I think he's effective, and it's kind of a blueprint they set up and never followed. I get that they just didn't want to follow, but then they followed this blueprint and it's like, I need to stop complaining. For the record, no rival will ever be as good as Silver, but I will also never be as good as Silver. So all in all, Blue is pretty good. And as we all know, the next step is to stop in front of this guy, open the menu, uh, teleport out before he fights us, walk to this guy with a slow poke, remember that I forgot Growl and curse out God, go back to the bridge and hey look! Yeah, everybody knows about the Mew glitch, but don't get rid of this guy just yet. Keep him in mind. It's a surprise tool that'll help me prove a point later. I'm not going to use this Mew if it's anything other than an HM user, but he's fun to have. Also in this generation, you can use Cut on Grass and it goes away, and I found this out from a random tweet last year and I lost my mind. I hope someone just had the same experience. The game is pretty linear at this point, you just kind of beat Misty, go on a boat, beat Surge, get a TM that will later help us break the game in twain, backtrack a bit and go through the big cave of the game and you get spit into Lavender Town. But after this, the game actually opens up a lot in a way that the series never really tried since recently. I think Pokemon is at its best in a sandbox environment. For all the problems that Legends and Scarlet and Violet have, I think these games set in stone that the core gameplay loop of Pokemon is at its best when you can just explore a world at your own pace and have that sense of discovery. It feels so right when it's a world inhabited by funny collectible creatures. This game is as close as you could possibly get on a Game Boy. After Lieutenant Surge, you can basically explore the rest of the entire region and do the next four gyms in any order. There's no longer one linear path to beat the game as the rest of the series has. In this run, I wanted to get my team together as quickly as I could, which involves grabbing the Eevee and Celadon and going back to Lavender to grab Growlithe before remembering there is no Growlithe here and a significant portion of my life has been consumed by a media franchise that actively hates me. Trading between twin versions of the same game is cute on the Game Boy when Game Freak was actually a small indie company on the verge of bankruptcy. In that context, it's kind of weird but an understandable experiment. Nowadays it's a blatant cash grab, but if I saw this in your house, I would judge you. But this is the curse that we live with now, so let's load up emulator number 2, wonder where my save file went, download one from online, catch a growl within a red version, and trading is actually really easy between emulators, like 99% of the time. It was being cranky today and would only progress when the window was focused, so I did do it in this like weird lockstep maneuver, but I did it. The next two team members will require some key items that require progressing the Team Rocket storyline, which is completely separate from gym progression. The gym is being completable in any order but without scaling to your level, so you can try to do a higher level gym first and punch up, you copycat son of a bitch. You do need to do Team Rocket in order, unless you don't want to. Yeah, you can skip the entire first dungeon, but I like to do it, because it's the perfect testing ground for my new favorite team member. The final part of the rocket quest line is in Silphco, and uh, this sucks. <laughs> I have no strategy for getting past this to this day. The entire building is just covered in warp tiles, and there's a key and a locked door that goes to Giovanni somewhere. I just kind of go up a floor and start walking on warp tiles randomly until I find it. Yeah, I could look up where the key is and it would be a lot less terrible, uh, but I opted to instead spend 20 minutes uh, doing this.
Yeah, it, it sucks. It's terrible. And then when you do find this stuff somehow, Blue shows up and he fights you. This guy's a Team Rocket apologist. Once you're done with this, you're done with Team Rocket. You don't see him again. Anytime during this quest, I could have just done the gyms, but I chose not to and just did the entire Rocket quest line in order. And now I get to go get my final team member and do the rest of the gyms however I please. Also, I forgot to grab the bike in Vermilion, but if you just hold left and press A, uh, the guard can't stop you. And the universe has to give you a bike. Uh, I love this game. Uh, the final team member is currently a rock in Pewter City, and we have to revive him. And while I'm here, I might as well just fight Blaine. I feel like I hear a lot when discussing older RPGs, but mostly from Pokemon fans, that you have to grind a lot in these games. Especially when the goddamn stupid-ass EXP share gets brought up. It's a quality of life thing, so we don't have to grind. And I guess it depends what you consider grinding. Fighting trainers along the critical path in like a couple wild Pokemon you happen to counter? That's not grinding, that's just playing the game normally. Running around in a patch of grass to kill things for an hour? That's grinding. I honestly have no idea where people have the idea that you have to grind heavily in these games. Maybe like right before the Elite Four and a couple of them? But there's a lot you can do to punch up hard. I feel like that's why every major gym leader and Elite Four member has a monotype team. I think I can show this off better later when I get to the Elite Four, but I promise you, you do not have to grind in this game. If you have a counter for what you're dealing with and you use your brain, you will be fine. Since I got my team before taking down Erika, which is technically the fourth in line, I can go back now with my weaker new Pokemon and train them up a bit. I think that's the intention behind what Scarlet and Violet try to do with the same idea, but it just doesn't work as the EXP share gives EXP to everything, which means everything will always be overleveled. I'll stop complaining about Scarlet and Violet now, but not for long, it's too fun. Sabrina's gym is the same warp tile bullshit as Silphco, but for some reason I have it seared into my memory that if you just hold left and then go down when you can't hold left anymore, you can get to her pretty easy. D don't ask. I usually fight her last because psychic types are really hard to deal with. They were just designed to be the best typing in the game, and I'm not kidding. They mostly have very high stats, and they have no counter because dark types do not exist yet. Their only weakness is bug type, meaning your options are uh, leech life, pin missile, and twin needle. Or just use uh, this and cross your fingers. Battling with friends was added super late into development, like a week or two before the game shipped, so the game is balanced like a single player game and it really shows sometimes. But now the final gym leader is unlocked all the way back in Viridian and whoa it's Giovanni, what the hell? I hate this twist, he's not threatening, I already beat this guy twice in a row and he's not that much harder. Then you beat him and he just kinda declares that Team Rocket is done now for reasons, it's been defeated. And now we can finally finish the game by going through Victory Road and being the Elite Four. Just have to beat the rival here, and I got my shit rocked. I run it back and just barely beat him with some tighter preparation. My team is so much lower level and I just barely pull through. I think this fight's a bit harder than the other critical fights that some Elite Four fights just because this team isn't monotype and is actually good, but I think I get a bit worried here about my team. Victory Road is pretty easy, it's just some strength puzzles and a pretty easy to navigate cave, but the trainers in here are actually pretty threatening. By the time I'm out of there I'm about level 40 and the Elite Four is all around 60, uh, which wouldn't be a huge deal if I also had money for items. Yeah, I don't know what happened in this game, I think I avoided too many trainers. Also, I forgot to evolve Growlithe. There we go. I plan on just testing the Elite Four, just buying some items in case and going in with the intention of getting levels, dying and getting out. Lorelei is the easy one. Ice is kind of a shit type, and the only one that's also not a water type is Jinx, so Jolteon can just sweep through the entire team without incident. It's not really impressive to beat Lorelei, she's by far the easiest, but it's a good consistent source of XP for Jolteon and it's at least reassuring I can hard counter her in the future. Bruno swaps between Rock and Fighting type, which makes coverage a bit harder, but Rock type is probably the easiest to check and Aerodactyl does a surprisingly good job cleaning up the Fighting types, so I have a consistent source of XP for more than Jolteon in just subsequent runs. Yeah, I'm playing this out like a roguelike just because I have no intentions of actually winning, but then I get to Agatha and the only Ghost types in this game are the Gassy line, which are also Poison types, so she's basically a Poison trainer, and Sandslash single-handed beats her entire team. At this point it's starting to look like I might actually win, but then come issues. I have no check for Lance. Nobody on my team can learn an ice move, and Dragonite could easily kick my entire team's ass with just Hyper Beam. It normally has a cooldown turn after you use it, but if you KO the opponent, because of a bug it just doesn't proc and you can just do it again. We're both down to our last Pokemon, Sandslash versus the Dragonite, and I just get insanely lucky. Yeah, I just mash Slash here and await my death, but he just doesn't do anything for like the rest of the fight. I assumed I lost at this point, but the AI in this game is really weird. But now I stand mere tiles from the mountaintop, and the only way is through my mortal enemy twitch.tv slash neobang. I won, and I did it more than 20 levels under. 
There's not a lot to do after the credits besides catch Mewtwo and finish the Pokédex, but there's a lot more of this game that I didn't show. For example, if this entire run didn't prove to you that you don't need a grind, then maybe this will. Oh, uh, hi Missing No. Interesting that the, the 7th inventory slot is now 127 of that item. Yeah, everyone knows Missing No, but I don't think many people realize the implications of having access to this dude at Cinnabar Island. Remember, you can beeline through Fuchsia and get here really early, and you can duplicate any item. If you really feel like you need to grind in this game, you can just duplicate some rare candies, some nuggets if you need money, and this might push the limit into cheating for some. But if grinding is annoying and you'd feel like you have to do it, and you would have more fun if you just did this, you can just do this. And if someone yells at you for cheating at Pokemon right on the Game Boy, wh whose problem is that? Also, remember my good friend Mew? It's called the Mew Glitch, but you can use it to get whatever Pokemon you want, really. If you replicate it with just defeating any other Pokemon but this Slowpoke, you'll get different results. Pokemon that appears is determined by the defeated Pokemon special stat, so get one with that special stat, fight a transform ditto, and you can get it. I could have used this to get anything in the game, including the Growlithe I had to trade over. I'm showing off a lot of glitches, and a lot of them are really famous, and I think people have the impression that these games are just unplayably glitchy, and that really isn't true. Everything I did intentionally, and it only really benefited how I wanted to play. Things like this that let you duplicate items or get any Pokemon are honestly closer to secret cheat codes and glitches, and none of these ruin the experience if you just don't want to engage with them. There are some more intrusive things that do exist. I mentioned Hyper Beam being really powerful, and also Focus Energy cuts your crit rate instead of boosting it. Healing moves can just randomly fail. Catching is really weird and doesn't work right. And there are issues beside that. I mentioned the limited early game Pokemon selection and how dungeon design is kind of terrible. Your bag is just a list of items and it is small. Every dungeon has a key item, and every time you get one of these or an HM, you gotta dump it in your PC immediately or your bag will be filled. Also, PC boxes have a limited amount of space, and once you reach 20 you can't catch anymore, and you don't get informed of this until you try to catch something, and I'm convinced the fabric of the universe itself is programmed in a way where this will only happen when you try to catch a legendary. And even despite all that, I think the core of this game really still holds up. The more open structure of the region is something that I think should have been adopted as a mainstay way earlier in the series, and we're only now coming out of the boring linearity that we've had for decades. And the mechanics of this game are, they're really just Pokemon. It's a formula that's endured for decades because collecting virtual creatures and building a team is just fun. I think this game's even better on repeat playthroughs because of that. Once you know where they are and how the world is laid out, you can plan out a whole team before you start. You aren't railroaded around Kano the same way you are in most other regions. Even the glitches add so much to the replayability. You can skip entire portions if you don't want to do them, you can bypass grinding, get things you aren't supposed to have access to, and that's a core part of this game to me. The obvious rebuttal is that everything I mentioned as a positive of the glitches could also be achieved with a game shark or a save editor, and yeah it could, but I don't agree that it's the same thing. There are limits to where and when you can do these glitches, and it takes more effort to say set up a Pokemon with an incredibly specific special stat and perform the glitch than it does to just edit it in. Yeah, you reach the same end goal, but there is a magic in working within the game's boundaries. The journey of doing these glitches is just as fun as any other part of the game to me. Pokemon is at its best as a sandbox, and this really is the ultimate sandbox. You can play normally and you might encounter a couple of bugs, but if you have the game knowledge to work out what you want to do, you can do basically anything. You can get any Pokemon you want. If grinding is annoying, just duplicate items, who cares? Exploit these tiles to get Safari Zone Pokemon because this minigame sucks ass. I haven't even mentioned some of the actually insane shit like glitch Pokemon. There's a Pokemon called 44HY and he evolves into Q Apostrophe and he hides his cancel button because he's shy, I love him. There's an item in this game called 8F that executes code based on what items are in your inventory and someone used it to code Pong. I think this game is still worth playing. If you're sick of the modern Pokemon games and want something to scratch that itch, give Red and Blue a shot. It's not long, I used emulator speed up obviously, but the entire recording of this took barely over 4 hours. And you can use whatever tricks you like to make the playthrough yours. I showed off a ton but there's so many more. Glitch City Labs is still a great resource despite being mostly shut down and converted to a Discord server. Please stop doing this, I hate it. If you just want to play it straight and do everything as they intended, then yeah, the remakes are probably the better games. But to me, they just feel so restrictive in comparison. It's the same base game and it is technically improved, but the content just isn't the same to me. Yeah, the game is still great without glitches, but with them, it's a wonderland of your own design amidst the broken code and dreams of five people coding an assembly for an almost dead handheld. God, Jesus. There's never really going to be another game in the series with this much freedom to build your own journey. If you've never played these games and you've been put off by others saying they're antiquated buggy messes, and what if I've said interests you at all, get in there, embrace that buggy mess. Have your journey.
Hello, it's me, Mucho. Uh, I have no idea who's actually subscribed to this channel or who's going to watch it outside of like my core friend group. Uh, but if you did finish this to the end, thank you, sincerely. I was never really happy with how I abruptly just stopped making videos. I just wasn't really inspired to keep making them. I love that I made my old videos. Their time capsules of the past and friends expressing to me that they genuinely appreciate these existing really helped me make this video. Like, actually, thank you. But I always kind of wanted to give this kind of video a shot, this video essay type thing. It just felt right. I don't think I would ever talk about something as high profile as Pokemon again. I just kind of had it on the brain in this convenient springboard for this. I don't know if I'm actually going to make any videos I have in mind. It kind of depends how this turns out. I'm happy with it, and people like it. I'll give it another go. But either way, I'm happy with this either being the swan song or a new beginning for the Moochow channel. His fate is in your hands. Either way, thanks.